Let's start in Ontario, where the Ford government is moving to block 55,000 education workers from going on strike and oppose a contract on them. But the union, known as CUPE, is planning to walk off the job anyway. If they say it's illegal to strike, then we will be on a political protest. We will withdraw our labour and we will fight back against this attempt to remove our members' rights and to institute a collective agreement. The sticking point generally is money. The province is offering a 2.5% salary increase for those making less than $43,000, but CUPE wants an 11.7% raise. Let's get the government's response. Ontario's Education Minister Stephen Lecce is with us from Queen's Park. Hi, Minister Lecce. Good to have you back on the program. Thanks for making the time. Thank you. Uh, Minister, the union says that, that you are bullying their members, that the message you're sending QP workers is do what we want or we'll legislate you. Uh, that is essentially what you are saying to them, is it not? You know, I think uh, a lot of kids and two million parents and their families feel a similar sentiment when the union announced on Sunday their path to a strike, irrespective of the government offering in good faith a better deal. We offered QP a off ramp. We said to them, look, let's come a day early. Wasn't supposed to be the case, but we said, let's have this meeting on Sunday because the union decided to put Ontario on a five day requirement to strike, affecting two million kids. And I believe, Ashley, in my heart, as I think most people watching, these kids have paid a great deal of consequence over the past year. We had strikes in Ontario, one of the only provinces in the, in the country to have strikes by unions, and then followed by a global pandemic. And at what time, at what point does a responsible government say enough? that these kids need to be in school. They need to be with their educators, they need to be with their friends, frankly, healing from the mental and physical health adversity that has come, and the learning loss that has now been confirmed by EQAO that every parent at home knew. And so, yes, we will stand up and take action because of a result of the unions on pathway to a strike by introducing a bill today that ensures this Friday there will not be disruption for two million kids. It keeps them in school, which is most important. And, and Minister, I am certainly in no way disputing the sentiment that I, I would agree uh, as a parent myself. Parents right across this province feel like they want their kids in school. But my question is more specific right. to what more your government could have done to ensure that is the case and that you're not forcing a contract right. on 55,000 people in this in this province. I take your point about yeah. the notice to strike, but could you not have said, hey, we're going to introduce some back to work legislation and continue with negotiations that were scheduled for tomorrow in an effort to come to an agreement? What you did was say, here's our final offer. Take it or we're forcing yeah. you back into this new contract. That's actually essentially what we did yesterday. We said rescind your five-day strike notice and we'll continue on with our negotiations, but they didn't, right? We actually gave them that choice, Fashi. Literally what you proposed is what I did yesterday through our team to, the, to QP, saying, look, rescind your offer. Let's agree to negotiate. We presented an option that we thought was sensible, fair, that increased the pay roughly 10% on average over four years, plus the maintenance of literally the best pension benefit and 131 days of sick leave. Uh, there's no program like this in Canada, frankly. It's very, by design, it, it really comes with a strong package to retain the workforce. And they said no. They actually rejected the offer. And they believe that by continuing on the strike on Friday, that, that somehow will deliver a better outcome for their members. And it, frankly, it won't. It's just sad that we're here because I actually believe that there was another way. I mean, I got a deal with every public sector union in education just a few years ago against great odds, but we did. And that would have been my preference in the premiers. But when you tell us yesterday that you're going to strike on Friday, and I know, and you know, the legislative calendar, that if we don't act today, introducing the bill and passing it before Thursday, there would have been two million kids at home and a lot of parents affected. And I will not tolerate that. I will not accept for one day a strike. That is not right after what these kids have been through. And someone has to have the political courage in this province and country to say enough. And that's what we're doing with this bill. We gave them that choice. We increased their wages and a better offer. And even still, they chose this path to strike. And obviously, they're living with the consequences today. I just want to be explicit, though, for, for parents and for Ontarians watching right now. Are, are you saying that if they had withdrawn the notice to strike, that you would have continued negotiating, that the offer you put on the table was not your final, final offer? We did offer them yesterday uh, an increased offer. We made it clear that if they rescind, uh, if they rescind their uh, commitment to strike on Friday, that dialogue could continue. But they didn't do that. That's my point to you. 
they had the option to withdraw the five-day strike notice because as I mentioned to you, if they did that, there wouldn't be such an imperative to pass this bill or introduce it today and pass it by Thursday because there wouldn't be a strike on Friday because that notice period is required by law of five days. They maintained the five days. They believe creating this pressure somehow achieves something for their members. What it really has done is force the hand of government not really our first choice, our last resort, to now resort to a legislated option that protects the integrity of learning and keeps children in class where they belong. They had that choice. And now they're stepping you know, in, the, in the midst of this. While we offered them more, they said, look, we want roughly a 50% increase in pay, an astronomical hike according to any standard in the private sector, the public sector, 33% more in just pay alone over three years. And I ask your viewers, how many of you have pensions that are indexed? with inflation? How many have benefits that cover all your family? They're a very strong benefit program, among the best in the country. How many have 131 paid sick leave? It just doesn't exist in the real world for most folks. And while I'm prepared to maintain those programs and incentives and entitlements for these staff, because we value them, there's 7,000 more hired under our progressive conservative government after all, I just don't think kids should pay the price because they're not getting a 50% nearly increase in your comp. That's unfair. And I think someone's got to say enough of that. Minister, and certainly I, I don't disagree that there are valid and tough questions for the union here. But with respect, uh, you didn't answer the specifics of my question. I, I, I hear you say that if they had withdrawn that, uh, you know, you gave a better offer in your characterization. But, but are, were you willing, if they were not going to strike, to continue negotiating and perhaps even improve the offer you tabled yesterday? Because I don't hear a clear answer to that. Yeah. I think our inclination, uh, if they decided to withdraw the strike vote, would be to remove the, uh, the legislation. Quite frankly, we never wanted to do this. I always wanted to get a deal, Vashi, that preserved in-person learning for children. But with great regret, they said to us yesterday, no, they will proceed with the strike. They will proceed with disruption and do what they have done just a few years ago to students, affecting millions of lives. And no responsible government should be a bystander and hope for the best. We took action today after transparently telling them that the we would just yesterday. And remember, what we're fighting for, 80 cents the dollar in education goes to compensation within our publicly funded schools. 80 cents the dollar goes to pay and benefits. 20 cents goes to our kids. And so I do believe we were given a mandate by the people of this province under the leadership of the Premier to say, look, I want more dollars flowing to our kids, more tutoring, more mental health, more investments in STEM education and a focus on getting back to the basics. None of this matters if these kids are out of school on Friday, next week and beyond. And keep in mind, next week, the legislature is not sitting. And so we made it abundantly clear they could have taken another path to avoid a strike and frankly to avoid this legislation, but they have forced the hand of government and we're now moving forward, proceeding, and we are committing to providing some stability after years of impacts that affected so many kids in this province. And I do want to ask about the, the legislation in a, sec in a second. I just want to make sure the characterization for the audiences, sure. and, and I take your point on what they're asking for and what their workers are asking for. The union also points out that their average member earns about $39,000 a year. So while you're you're saying they're asking for these astronomical no. raises, I mean, they're, they're asking for stuff, and I know that includes some part-time workers, but they're asking for stuff against the backdrop of astronomical inflation. And yes, they have a good benefits package, but they also, uh, you know, they, they also perform a great service for, for the kids of this province. Just just to make that clear, I, I do they want do, to minister, which is, I know you which say is, you value that, but I just want to make that clear for our audience too. Go ahead, sir. No, 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 I know, and I just want to make very, very briefly, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just, I think it's so important. First off, we pay our education workers in Ontario more than any province in Canada. They make $27 an hour on average. And as I mentioned, the benefits, the pensions, the sick leave, all of this together makes the program quite competitive. So we value them, which is why we're hiring 1,800 more of them, part of this proposal. And of course, as we know, the average pay in the compensation package is actually $49,000. The union has included part-time workers. So let's, I just want to make sure we're consistent uh, in those facts. But the fact is we do pay them more than our peers in the country, East and West, and we'll continue to do so with a 2.5% increase every single year under our plan. And I get that. I'm just pointing out that even $49,000 a year, for example, yeah. in this inflationary environment is, is really hard to get by on. Just before I let you go, because you know this is a national audience and they're watching sure. closely your government's use of the notwithstanding clause here. I, I do want to be clear. This is the second time your government has used it. Are Ontarians to take away from that, that every time the charter gets in the way of something that is politically significant or expedient to your government, you're willing to use that clause to uh, effectively stomp on those rights? 
We believe that the best path to a deal is a voluntary one consented by all parties. That is the message we're sending. But when we offer a union an option and an off-ramp to avoid a strike and to avoid a contract being legislated, and they decide to proceed with the strike, um, you should expect the government to stand up for the right of children to learn to be in school and not to face disruption. That is our obligation, moral obligation, to millions of children that depend on government to have the political courage to say enough. And uh, frankly, we, don't, we would have preferred not to do this, but given the options, either we do so with providing absolute certainty we could avert strikes this Friday and every day thereafter, or the option of potential backdrop of impacts and withdrawal of services, we opt on the side of families, of children, of mental health and learning loss. We opt on the side of kids who simply just want to be with their friends on Friday. And that's what this bill will do. It provides the stability children deserve. But, but the question is, will it? I mean, the, the union still plans on striking. And, and back to my question about invoking the notwithstanding clause. I mean, that's a serious thing. That's saying that yes. I take your point about the right of kids to be in school, but you know there are labor uh, rights associated with labor in this country: the right to collective bargaining, mm -hmm. the right to striking. Yeah. You are effectively, you know, introducing the notwithstanding, adding the notwithstanding clause of this to to go around those rights. That's a that's a pretty big deal too. Is that something that Ontarians should expect more commonly from your government when it comes up against something that's against its own political interests? I think uh, Ontarians should expect the government to continue to negotiate with all Labour parties, partner, partners, public and private, to get the best possible deal for all of us, something we could all live with that is respectful of all members. But if a union, in this case CUPE, is committed to striking impacting millions of kids, then the government will act in the public interest over one's self-interest and ensure stability, ensure kids are in school. And that, frankly, is really important to the government and to a lot of parents out there who have faced a massive level of impact and adversity. We owe it to them to take this action, even though we have made it abundantly clear, as regrettable it is to be in this position, because I would have preferred to have had a voluntary agreement signed yesterday or at least a path to one with the commitment that the union would take the, the strike off the table on Friday. But they didn't, and we're here, and we're acting, as we said we would, to make sure these kids stay in school. Minister, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much for your time this evening. Appreciate it as always. Thank you. Welcome back to Power and Politics. I'm Vashi Capellos in Ottawa tonight. The Ontario government is moving to block 55,000 education workers from going on strike and impose a contract on them. But the union representing those workers, it's known as CUPE, well, it's saying that, that those workers plan to walk off the job anyway. If they say it's illegal to strike, then we will be on a political protest. We will withdraw our labour and we will fight back against this attempt to remove our members' rights and to institute a collective agreement. Ontario's Education Minister Stephen Lecce insists his government's priority is simple, keep kids in school. I will not accept for one day a strike. That is not right after what these kids have been through. And someone has to have the political courage in this province and country to say enough. And that's what we're doing with this bill. We gave them that choice. We increased their wages and a better offer. And even still, they chose this path to strike. And obviously, they're living with the consequences today. All right, let's bring in the power panel to talk about that back and forth. Corey Tonight, Sharon Carr, Rob Russo, and Brad Levine. Corey, I'll, I'll start with you. I, I think the government's framing here is really interesting. Like this is, and, and you heard the minister say it multiple times in our interview, this is about keeping kids in school. It is taking a, yep. a, a, a very, you know, unprecedented, almost unprecedented step to do so. It's basically using legislation to impose a contract on, on those workers. Tell me a little bit about how the government you think sees this politically. Well, I think we're in a very unique situation after the pandemic where we had school closures and remote learning for lengthy periods of time. Uh, children's education has suffered as a result. Children's mental health has suffered as a result. It was very difficult decisions made by public health officials and governments and, you know, doing that. But the, the, but the, the net result is that, you know, we are in a, in a position where having schools closed for a period of time uh, is not in the interest of parents. It's not in the interest of students. Uh, it's not in anyone's interest, uh, you know, and QP deciding to go there, you know, or very early on in negotiations is uh, is a really bad misread uh, of, uh, of them, of, of where the public's at. You know? And as much as they think the government would be intimidated by some QP workers uh, picketing on the lawn of Queen's Park, uh, there would be a riot of parents 
uh, hundreds of times the size of that uh, if the government allowed the schools to close uh, over over a labor dispute. So, you know, I think the government's on the right, making the right call to side with uh, with parents and students over, over uh, uh, these uh, these workers who are are taking a, a, a really ill advised job action. My guess is, Brad, that your read is a little different and, and that maybe the framing would be, too, um, around the government siding with kids and parents over over the workers. How, how do you see it? Yeah. Yeah. And 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 to disclose, um, my firm and I have done some uh, polling for the QP educational uh, workers um, uh, in the in the uh, in the recent past. Um, I think it's significant what's happened today. This is this is a provincial government that is using the notwithstanding clause uh, to take away the rights of 55,000 Ontarians uh, to exercise their right to free collective bargaining. Uh, that is that is quite a, 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 an outrageous uh, move of this government. The 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 leverage that. Uh, workers have uh, in this country uh, is to bargain collectively and withdrawing their labor by by taking uh, strike votes are part of the leverage and today the, what you saw is that the Doug Ford conservatives basically threw up their hands and said uh, we will take away the rights of these people uh, in our province uh, in in order to impose uh, a, uh, a a low low wage uh, contract uh, these folks don't make a lot of money. The, the average salary of these education uh, workers is $39,000. Uh, and they just wanted to, uh, after the pandemic, Corey rightly says that kids went through a lot. So did the people uh, that work in our schools. Uh, and they didn't uh, work from home. These folks went in uh, uh, to, uh, to the schools uh, to uh, ensure that the education uh, of, the, of, the, of their kids uh, were main, was maintained uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, they, were just, they were just fighting for, for what, they, uh, what they felt was fair and to, to catch up from years of, of low pay. Uh, and that right's been taken away. And so the signal, the political signal is uh, who's next? Uh, which rights of uh, which workers uh, will be next on Doug Ford's agenda? Uh, today it was CUPE, education workers. Uh, who knows uh, uh, who's teachers. going to be next? T yeah, I was going to say teachers. Teachers, teachers, that, yeah. teachers will be next. Well, there we go. Oh, you're, you're, Corey, Corey, why don't you, us. Why don't, Corey, why don't you just walk through all, all the people in, in, <laughs> well, in Ontario whose rights well, we know you guys well, are going to uh, legislate look, away? I, I, I think, how how, this, how this, bullish this, of you to Brad use the notwithstanding clause? I need to get everyone else That is such a... That is clearly, clearly... To use the notwithstanding clause to, to basically say that we're going to remove the rights of these people from free collective bargaining, uh, that's 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 a real statement. And if you you want to announce today, Corey, who's next? Uh, please do, and we'll. Uh, okay, wait. We'll, let's I'll take let's let Corey weigh in, and then I want to get uh, Rob and Sharon in too. Corey, go well, ahead. Well, I'm going to say two things. One, there's nothing anti-labor about this government. Uh, I Brad just would took wish away to rights. So. What, 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 let him finish, I'll, I'll let Brad. Finish. Let him finish. Now you let me finish. Yeah. Uh, all of the unions that used to support Brad in the private sector have uh, almost wholesale moved over and support the Ford Conservative government. The Ford government is not anti-union. Uh, it is not anti-union at all. It's not anti-collective bargaining. But it is not the same situation for public sector unions that have a monopoly on, on our school system. Uh, there are more uh, rights at play here, including the rights of, of the children, uh, including the rights of the parents. And so it's not the same situation. So uh, let's just make it very clear, though, what the government is saying, and this will extend to teachers as well, is if you uh, want to sit down and negotiate a contract, the government's at the table to do so. If you want to use children as a pawn uh, in your labor negotiations by closing schools and threatening closure of schools, you're going to get legislated back, including the use of the notwithstanding clause. You can take that to the bank because it's going to happen. OK, well, that's that's a pretty significant statement. Uh, Sharon, I'll get you to weigh in on it as well. And I, I think it's significant for a number of reasons, because I, I get I, I understand the primacy of kids being at school. I don't think there's a parent in this province who isn't sympathetic to that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there is a right that exists, uh, the right to strike, the right to collective bargaining. And uh, the, the idea that if you threaten to, to, to do that, to strike, that then uh, the contract just gets imposed is certainly going to be an interesting political precedent as well. Yeah, so I would say looking at this from a bit of a different perspective, we did just come out of a pandemic that had a really, really big impact on everybody. But more so, it had a really big impact on kids, um, specifically those who are doing online learning or whatever the case is. So I think collective bargaining is super important. It's extremely important to workers' rights. But 
I personally find it a bit distasteful to immediately jump into strike mode, just given what has happened over the last few years. I also think it's a bit tacky to now push in the notwithstanding clause, which is not used for stuff like quite often. Do I think anyone is a winner in this? Not necessarily, but I, I do think that if UP and the Ontario government want to sit down together in a, I would say, in the usual mediation process they go with these, but not threaten a strike right off the bat, just take into consideration what everyone has been through. These are people who are not paid a lot of money. I completely agree with that. But jumping to the conclusion of a strike, even though that is their right, and that is what happens during these um, discussions, I just think it's, it's unfair to families and unfair to parents right now. Yeah, I think it's a, a good point. I should point out also the government contends that they make $49,000 a year on average and that the $39,000 figure from the union does also include some part-time workers. But I think Sharon's point, Rob, uh, is a good one. It seems like this is like very heated and very uh, impactful uh, for, for a group of people that already have felt a lot of impacts. And I'm not just speaking of the unions and I'm not just speaking of the government, but like it's very high stakes uh, and very forceful on on all around when really the kids are the one that we're supposed to be thinking about. Right well, Brad, Brad referred to polling and I, I'm pretty sure that Corey has some polling that he's got as well that uh, that he's acting on and his, <laughs> the government that he's worked for is acting on. I'd really love to know what that polling uh, is showing. <laughs> I can tell you that I did my own little poll. Oh, I can tell you. I'm happy to uh, I, I'm, Okay, okay to we're going to come back. Keep yeah? this segment going. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I went to my, I did my own little poll. I went to my younger sister, Anna Maria, who's got a couple of elementary school age kids, and I asked her about, about this, uh, and she said that it would be very tough uh, on, on her kids and, and on her, and on, uh, she, she leads a team. It would be tough because they're, doing, uh, they're slowly doing a return to work, and this would probably throw that into some disarray. Um, uh, so, so there might not be a, a lot of sympathy uh, for, for those who withdrew their, their labor at, at, at this time right now. That being said, uh, if I was, I, I don't care what my salary is, if, if, I, if inflation is running at 7 or 8% and somebody's offering me 1.5 or 2%, I'm not going to be happy about that either. So there, there does seem to be a, a, lack, a lack of fairness that way. Um, but as somebody said to me who was involved in the, the last time teachers went on strike province-wide who worked for Mike Harris, you can rarely go wrong taking on the teachers in Ontario. Really? Yeah. Okay, then what, what does the polling show to that effect, Corey? Well, it shows that, yeah, like, I think you'd have trouble finding a parent in the province of Ontario that thinks having schools closed right now is a good idea. I, 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 it would be a polling challenge to find one. Like, it, this is, this, to say that, the, that keeping schools open is popular uh, is, uh, is a dramatic understatement of what the, the research demonstrates. Uh, nobody wants to see the schools closed. And, you know, there was a negotiating table. QP has decided to, uh, you know, use children as a, as a pawn, as a hostage in a negotiation here in a way that is incredibly inappropriate in the views of the public. And uh, you know what? Uh, they're going to find out the hard way that that is not the way to get business done with this government. I'm sorry. I want to get you in a second. I, I will. I just I, I guess I would offer like a, a respectful challenge. And I get I think I get what you're saying about the polling. Like I said, I don't think there's a parent here that wants to see the schools close either. But does this government see that as an opportunity, like a political window to be able to throw a hammer at no, unions? No, I, I don't know, because we're not interested in throwing a hammer at unions like what else this is government. What it's very, it's very well, there's a difference between public sector unions and private sector unions in terms of the way they can wield power within the labor force and the, and the difference in terms of their actual circumstances. So, you know, there are a lot there are a lot of schools of thought that think public sector uh, employees should not be allowed to unionize, period. So like, I, I, to, to think that these are, are the same uh, kettles of fish is very different. This government has been incredibly pro organized labor on a whole host of fronts. And that is why we have uh, gained support politically from private sector union after private sector union, much to the disappointment and dismay of Brad Levine and the uh, Ontario NDP. Okay. But I'll that's, that's changed and it's gonna be there for a long time. Okay, Brad, go uh, ahead. But it's not anti-labor. Yeah, well, you are anti-labor, Corey, because you just invoked the notwithstanding clause and imposed a contract on 55,000 workers. You, 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 you have, this, you have this, uh, this distinction between if you work in construction or if you work uh, in a school, therefore, all of a sudden, there's a two-tier here. You're, 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 Doug Ford's not going to uh, invoke the notwithstanding clause if you work in construction, but if you work in a school or if you work in a hospital or if you work anywhere in the public sector, uh, you know, Doug Ford is coming after you. That's what you 
you basically said today. You can't make the distinction between two classifications of workers just because one's in the public sector, one's in the private sector. The, 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 the building trade support that you got in the last uh, election actually came from the Liberals. We, uh, the New Democratic Party actually picked up uh, public sector uh, unions from the Liberals. What we, you saw is the hollowing out of Liberal support by any unions. And some went to the Conservatives, some went to the Democrats. So let's make sure that the record here is clear. Mm -hmm. But again, Corey, the, the, the notion that you, that you claim that education workers are using children as pawns, I think is, I think is flippant, and I think it's a little bit disrespectful to the people who make their living, no, no, Let who make finish. their living day in and day out, who get paid quite poorly, uh, it, you know, $39,000 or even $45,000, whatever. That is, that is pretty low to live in a city like the, uh, Toronto, the GTA. Um, and there was widespread support in this province for the $3.85 that QP uh, was looking for. Their hourly rate was going up. Okay. They, they agree, even, even, even the ones that supported Doug Ford in the, in the last election said three eighty five dollars was a fair hourly wage increase and they thought that $39,000 was too low. And you know what they were worried about? They we're worried about you guys hollowing out our schools. These are these are okay. folks that that teach our, our children with uh, special that, needs, sorry, gotta, all of those kinds of people. And if you if you pay if you keep paying them poorly, they're all going to leave the sector, and mm -hmm. nobody's going to be able to teach uh, our, uh, our 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 children in our I, schools. I, and that's that's yeah, the fear it, that this contract well, is well, going to provide. I, th I think you're both making uh, salient points, and I and I want to get Sharon and Robin because I've obviously dumped the next topic, and we're just going <laughs> going for this. Um, uh, but but look, I I, I think that the challenge challenge I offered, Corey, there's an, a, another challenge to Brad, too, and that is on, on Rob, the idea that, and this is what Sharon said, that there, that a lot of parents in this province would be uncomfortable with any threat to strike, right? Like, I get the yeah. points they're making about more. I think those points about what they earn, what they make, those are, uh, that's a valid negotiation to have. But, but why do you have to threaten to the, the first point I'd like to make is, is that never mind Elon Musk charging to get onto Twitter. I think we should charge viewers to watch the debate between <laughs> Brad and Corey. Uh, it's <laughs> insightful and entertaining. The second point I'd, I'd like to make is that 25 years ago, when there was a province-wide strike, it ended uh, much sooner than the teachers had hoped for, uh, even though public opinion polls showed that they had some support at the time because they, they overplayed their hand, it turned I remember, out. I lived in it. That's right. And they had no end game. I'm wondering what the teacher's end game is, or the teacher, the education worker's end teachers game. Teachers are next, Corey. Says. Yes, yes. Well, but, <laughs> and, and that's why I, I, this I'm is happy important. I'm speculate. No, 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 let him finish. Sorry, I, think yeah. there's actually, I think there's actually an interesting point here, and I think that the QP members are being used by the teachers' unions here in a, in a pretty unflattering way. Brad says they want to have, what is, would you say, $3.80 uh, an hour increase? Anyway, what it works out to is 11%. And and they want to they they want to go forward with an initial negotiation where they put the the lowest wage workers first and say oh don't don't worry about what the percent is it's just it's just this much per hour well that's eleven percent who in Ontario is expecting eleven percent raise this year who like like nobody but, but they but, want them they want but, them to go first but this is this yeah. is what the strategy is right. on on the union side the strategy is to put the QP members first. Uh, uh, at an hourly wage to try to get a big number that is, frankly, completely unaffordable. The province is basically broke, just like the rest of the provinces. Well, actually, They're a lot less huge than cost, it used to be. And, well, and a hu facing huge cost pr pressures, uh, especially in healthcare. Uh, you know, it'd be nice if everyone could get an 11 percent raise, but that's not in the interest of fighting inflation. That's not in the interest of not driving the, the province into bankruptcy. So, you know, yeah. you got to come to the table with something realistic and 11 percent is not realistic. Well, I, I, I understand why you come to the table, though. Like if I'm coming asking for a raise, it's definitely going to be somewhere in and around inflation, if not more. I'm not expecting that that will be the end result. Yeah, uh, Sharon, well, and, 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 and to be fair, the teachers are in a different category in they are. right? than education workers. That's that's the only point I would add to that. But I but I do understand that there are pressures on the province's finances, too. And that has to be a consideration. Uh, Sharon, I'll give you the last word, I think, because I'm getting yelled at in the control room so go ahead I, uh, I don't know how to follow these two guys after that i think for starters everyone's gonna hold hands and make up now but as the true centrist that i am going to be i think that i think that everyone's making a valid point on what it means i think that uh, corey is right like no one wants to see parents it's not just kids on school or parents not at work there's just like a whole ripple effect and no one wants the threat of teachers going on strike but to brad's point these are people who are not paid a lot of money so i think from the perspective of the government and from QP's perspective, 
everyone needs to take the temperature down by like a lot and work the, work through this in a way that it's not going to impact kids and families, taking into consideration what we've just gone through with COVID and kids being stuck at home for a long time. So I would like, there's no perfect answer. There's no real winner here. But at the same time, it just, I, I do think the kids and families are the victims here right now of this. And we just need to be mindful of what they've dealt with in the last couple of years, just like everyone else. I appreciate the point being made to conclude us. I highly doubt that's the, that's going to happen going forward. But thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Corey Tonight, Sharon Carr, Brad Levine, and Rob Russo. Really appreciate the discussion. I'm glad we had it. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.